first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dora, Jane, um, and the organizing committee for inviting me um, uh, to be part of this great event. Um, and it's a real honor, and I, I take it um, very seriously to actually open the conference with this keynote. It's very special to me. Uh, why? Because uh, I believe BASM is the, the jewel of sports medicine globally, and, um, and so it's great to be here. And also, as Dora mentioned, um, I spent 15 years in this city. Uh, it was some of my best times in terms of both personal and uh, career-wise. Um, my son was born uh, at the old York Hill Hospital, which is not too far away from here. And I can tell you, um, taking a teenager um, out of Glasgow to, down to England, he keeps on telling me, Dad, you destroyed my life. Um, a reflection of this great city. Um, also, as I go through the presentation, and I'm sorry, I will have to go quite fast, but I hopefully um, will make the messages, the important messages clear to you, you'll see that a lot of what I'll present to you um, was done actually um, here at, um, at the University of Glasgow, this great university. So I'm particularly proud to be here. So let me get started due to time. Um, and we have a, a very, very important topic, and it's, and it's great to see this topic right at the front of this conference. Um, and. Um, just to illustrate the importance of this topic, how much do you think genetic testing is worth? And I spent some time just looking at this and trying to, and given there's a huge interest um, uh, and advance in this area coming out of Asia, um, any ideas how much this, this field is worth? Well, that's the biggest number I've had to actually mention at a conference. It's one trillion, okay? Um, uh, and uh, this is what we're dealing with. And it's, as we heard as well from President of Films, this is a, a, a great uh, opportunity, but also there are dangers that I think um, we, you, um, have to actually tackle. And my goal today um, is to try and actually um, illustrate some of those dangers, but also um, those opportunities. Um, and to do this, and to do it in an informed way, um, I'd like to spend the first half of my time um, going over some of the history, which I think is very important, so that we're all starting off um, at the same basis um, as we move on to the, the, the real issues, which is basically how harmful is this? Is it fun? Can it be fun? And more importantly, to conclude on the most important bits, uh, which is the helpful side. And as Thor already alluded, um, I never knew at the time of accepting this lecture that we can actually really be in a situation to, to help sport and exercise medicine by having the technology available to all of us. You know, um, and I'm, I will conclude with that, but I may have to jump over some slides given the time. Um, so in terms of history, um, I think it's quite important that we, we go back in time a little bit to uh, and I'm going to talk very much about the history of uh, omics, but in particular focus on genetics. Um, and try and make it a little bit of fun, because I know it's early in the morning, it's the start of the conference, and um, you're not all uh, specialists in genetics, so I'll, I'll do my best to make this as interesting and fun as possible. And therefore I'm going to go through this uh, roadmap, um, not in too much detail, um, just to illustrate some points, starting from um, ancient Greece, a lot of what I'll say is also in the history of excess physiology, this great textbook published in 2014 uh, by Charles Tipton, uh, the chapter here by Claude Bouchard and Rob Molina, and that's especially for the students who may want to go back and read some of this in more detail. So given also the, the stressing of excise is medicine, I, I particularly love this quotation uh, from Hippocrates from the book one of uh, dietetics, um, and I'll read it to you because it is quite profound. Uh, eating healthily by itself will not keep a man well. He must also have physical exercise. Food and exercise, while possessing opposite properties, nevertheless mutually contribute to maintaining health. It is the nature of exercise to draw on the body's materials, while it is the nature of food and drink to restore them. It is necessary, as it appears, to determine the exact powers of various exercises, both natural and artificial, and which of them will contribute to the development of muscle and which to wear and tear. Furthermore, one must proportion exercise to the quantity of food, to the predisposition of the person, to his age, to the season of the year, to the changes of the winds, to the geographical place in which the person resides, and to the climatic conditions of the specific year. Note the underlined word there, which is predisposition. It was very clear, even in ancient times, that hereditary was going to be, and is very, very important. And Jumping now a bit ahead and going 
you're all very familiar with Charles Darwin's work, um, but I like to illustrate the work of Sir Francis um, Galton, who was the cousin of Darwin. And the reason is because he wrote something quite profound. Um, he wrote quite a bit that was quite profound. Um, I'm going to draw your attention particularly to 1892, to the Heritage Genius, where he wrote, and you can see it, and uh, I don't know if you can read that, it's too, probably too small, but I would argue from what I will focus on here that he was probably the first sport and exercise geneticist. Um, and I'll illustrate that with this second bit that I'll have to read, I'm afraid, because you probably can't see it. Everybody who has trained himself to physical exercise discovers the extent of his muscular powers to a nicety. When he begins to walk, to row, to use the dumbbells, or to run, he finds to his great delight that his thews strengthen and his endurance of fatigue increases day after day. So long as he's a novice, he perhaps flatters himself, there's hardly an assignable limit to the education of his muscles. But the daily gain is soon discovered to diminish, and at last it vanishes altogether. His maximum performance becomes a rigidly determined quantity. He learns to an inch how high and how far he can jump. When he has attained the highest state of training, he learns to half a pound the force he can exert on the dynamometer by compressing it. He can strike a blow against the machine used to measure impact and drive its index to a certain graduation, but not further. So, it's, so it is with running and rowing and walking and every other form of physical exertion. There's a definite limit to the muscular powers of every man, which he cannot by any education or exertion overpass. So he talks very nicely here about those limits, which now we know are set by genetics. In a sense, how you've chosen your parents. And the cliche is that everything is possible. Well, I'm afraid it's not. We have those limits. Um, I don't have time to go and read the, the next part down here, but he talks on, and I do recommend you read this chapter, he talks about the same limit existing in terms of intelligence. So please, um, especially the, the students in the audience, I really direct you to, to read this. It is quite fascinating to read. Big jump again now um, to 1971, because up until now, we know that genetics hereditary is going to be important, but we don't know the specifics, the genes. Um, and we also have to appreciate that we are talking about 1971. At this point, the tools weren't available that we have today. Um, and, and Vasilis Klusuras, out of McGill in Canada, did something quite remarkable. He didn't have the tools, so he had to think of another way of getting to understand the importance of genetics. And he pioneered the twin study approach, looking at comparing the response of identical twins and non-identical twins. As we all know, um, uh, the identical twins share their genome, and the non-identical twins will share the same kind of um, uh, distribution as any uh, siblings. Um, and he was particularly interested in, in looking at performance parameters. And you can probably see here, he looked at maximal oxygen uptake, he looked at maximal blood lactate, and also maximal heart rate. The solid circles are the monozygotic twins, the identical twins, and the open circles, the dizygotic twins. And what you can see, you can see this very strong relationship between uh, the monozygotic twins, not a great relationship in the dizygotic twins. And that is for all these parameters. And and determining an algorithm, uh, which, which he called the heritable estimate, he was able to show that for VO2 max, the heritability estimate was as high as 93%, which is telling us how, uh, what we all now know, um, how, um, for example, maximal oxygen uptake is genetically determined to a very large extent. And he did the same thing for the other uh, blood parameters. So that at the time was really revolutionary. He was um, uh, Mr. Sports Genetics at the time. Um, a few weeks ago at the European, uh, at EFSMA, European Congress of Sports Medicine, um, I had the pleasure to, to present uh, um, a summary of this lecture in some ways, and I referred to this event that happened in Brazil in 2014. Um, and you'll see Vasilis Klesuras there, you may recognize some other faces, but I also want to draw your attention to this gentleman here who will feature a lot in my lecture, and that is Claude Bouchard. Um, because what I reminded the audience there, and, and actually in, at EFSMA in Porto Rose, um, in the audience was Vasilis himself, that in Brazil, when he, when he gave this lecture about his, the historical overview of the field, um, someone stood up in the audience, and it was Claude Bouchard, who actually 
um, mentioned to the audience that it was Vasilis's work that inspired him to go on to do, and as it will feature so much in my, in the, my presentation day, the work that you will see, which we all know very well. And, it, and as, we, as I'm going through the next slides, I think this will become quite clear. Um, I've seen further, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, uh, and that'll become clear as we, as we go through this. So, um, so what did Claude Bouchard do, having learned from uh, and been inspired from Vasilis? Um, he, he, he applied the same methodology, the twin study approach, but looking at trainability. Um, and you can see the same kind of approach here. You can see the correlation is not as high as it was for VO2 max, but you can see the very high um, uh, heritable estimate of over 70%. Again, telling us now what we also know, that is that the training response is, has a very strong heritable component. Um, and the quest that we'll talk about uh, this morning is how do we individualize and understand that response to training. Um, Jumping further now um, to, the, to the end of the, the uh, 1990s, to the work of Hugh Montgomery. I think uh, Hugh is probably well known to, uh, uh, especially um, some of the older physicians in the room. Um, I owe actually my first grant from the BBSRC to uh, Hugh Montgomery in a collaboration that we set um, at around about that time. But he was the, the guy who, the, 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 the intensivist, who really pioneered the candidate gene approach. And the approach then was to actually go for genes that there was a theoretical reason, a rationale, as to why these genes were important. Um, and as an intensivist, he was particularly interested in the renin-angiotensin system and the control of blood pressure. Um, and so it's obvious that he was going to look down those kind of pathways. And this is actually a slide that I, I took from a presentation that um, Hugh did actually here in Glasgow uh, many years ago. Um, and his conclusion at the time was that variation in this gene does influence athletic ability. That the D version, and remember we inherit a, a one allele from our mother, one allele from our, our father. So uh, here the, the, having a D allele is associated with increased strength and having the I allele associated with endurance. That is what um, uh, he concluded from, our, from his presentation. And some of you will remember this was probably, this at the time uh, was one of the most talked papers uh, in the field. You can see the title here, Human Gene for Physical Performance. And he shows very nicely, if you just focus here at the moment, that when he compared climbers, and these were climbers who would without oxygen get to the top of, of, of mountains like uh, Mount Everest, without supplementary oxygen, and you can see that the genotype for the climbers um, uh, was about 50% of them had the II genotype, compared to a control group that had just over 20%. And so the conclusion was that this gene uh, was, uh, was, as you can see here, the first gene for human performance. He also did a practical experiment where he looked at a muscle endurance, and you can see here that the II genotype had a greater performance, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a kind of bicep curl uh, type exercise that he was, he was doing. But to illustrate the kind of problem of this candidate gene approach, uh, I'd like to mention the study that we published together with you also done in Glasgow, but some years later, uh, where we took um, uh, some of the world's greatest swimmers, uh, European swimmers from the Commonwealth, Russia, and, and also American swimmers, and also swimmers from East Asia. And in, in genetics, we know power is very important, and it's got to do with how many individuals we can actually test. And at the time, this is one of the, and it still is actually, one of the biggest genetic studies of, of uh, sports performance. You can see the numbers here. We have the uh, short and medium distance swimmers, 400. Uh, you can see the total numbers here. The, the control, over, uh, as you can see here, is well over 1,000. And here we have the East Asian swimmers as well, significant amount of numbers. What did we find? And don't worry about the text here. If we just look on the left-hand side here, these are the, the, the European swimmers. And as the theory predicted, if you look at the DD, which is the sprint type, you can see that over 40% here uh, had the right version, and it was statistically significant. So that fitted the hypothesis. So we were excited about that. Until we looked on this side here, which is the Asian swimmers, and now the sprint, sw the sprint swimmers, it was the II version that was overrepresented. So it went the other way. It went the wrong way. 
And the practicalities, because let's remember the topic for today is genetic testing, um, that if we were to select these individuals using the genetic test, you'd have to have a different test for an Australian or European here or for the Japanese athlete. You can see it's going in contrasting ways, and it shows you the problem of using single genes uh, to make these kind of predictions, which is typically what a lot of these companies will do, as will become clear later on. Jumping further ahead now, um, the Heritage Family Study. Um, and I'm going to stress that study quite a bit, because I would argue it is probably the only study that has been properly costed uh, multi-center study in the area of genetics in, in terms of sport and exercise medicine. Um, and saying that will also mean that the fact that we don't know as much as we should do also relates to the fact that there isn't the funding or hasn't been the funding in place until recently to do this kind of work. And let me make that point as I go forward. Um, the, the specifics of the cohort will become clearer, but you can, you can read it in your own time here. I want to focus very much on, on, on this side. The study was funded in 1992, five institutions. Phase one was from 1997 to 2001. Phase two from 2001 to 2004, uh, where they were trying to establish the cohort and then exploit the cohort. And this is the first study they published, which was in 1995. How many papers do you think this cohort has, has actually generated to date? Have a guess. You probably won't get this. It's 190 papers published from this one cohort, and the, study, and the papers are still coming, all from one study. Massive uh, undertaking, as you can imagine, and also the study that's really um, uh, provided us with a lot of information that I'm going to share with you today. Also, by looking at some of the literature and preparing for today, I also found out, uh, which I wasn't aware of, that uh, president uh, of the IOC then, Juan Antonio Samaraj, had awarded the group the, the 1999 Sports Science Award for, uh, from the International Olympic Committee, a reflection of, of that work. And this study here, you probably can't see, it's too small, is actually a study looking at the large-scale multicentral genome-wide association study, account for smoking behavior, identifies multiple significant loci for blood pressure. This was the latest study they published from the cohort, um, and this was published just a year ago. So you can see more and more things are coming from this one study. The message being here, if we really want to get genetic testing to work, which is a great opportunity, we have to finance the studies properly, and that is the point of, of stressing this. So what did they do very briefly? Um, I already mentioned that they had, there was um, uh, 20 families, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, a total of 481 sedentary adult Caucasians from 98 generation families who undertook 20 weeks of training. And here you see the kind of responses that we typically expect. Most of them improved by, you can see the amount here, but between 200 and 600 uh, moles per minute. Some improved very little to almost nothing, and others improved a lot. Um, and this is what the heritage study was trying to understand, is how can, we underst how can we determine the individual response to the same amount of training, which in this case, multicenter trial was very standardized. And here you can see the different families, the, the, res the responses to VO2 max as a result of training. And just because of time, what, what they showed was that there was two and a half times more variance between the families than within the families. Also note the maximum heritability here of about 50%, 47% to be exact. Um, so it was, as you saw from phase one before that I mentioned, it was to establish the cohort, and they did a great job in doing that. Then they started to exploit the genetics, and this is now in 2011, and you can see they were really a ahead of themselves. Most of us in sport and exercise uh, medicine have only recently started doing these kind of genome-wide association studies where you can interrogate the whole genome. Um, they were already ahead of themselves, they had the money as well. They started doing this in 2011. And this is a kind of typical, for those not in the area, it's called the Manhattan plot, because it looks like the Manhattan skyline. Each of these colors represents one of the 22 autosomes, and what you're looking for, and each of these dots represents a genetic variant. Um, and you could have from 100,000 to up to over a million. And you can also appreciate the statistical difficulty of finding effects here because you need to divide your p-value by how many tests you do. And unless you find um, uh, a tower of responses here reaching the, the level of statistical significance of 10 to the power of minus 8, the reality is you've not found anything. And you can't see any towers here, so 
in 2011, using the, the arrays that they had available then, they were not able to uh, determine the genetic response, but they were ahead of their time in what they were doing. The, they did find a number of, of, of genes that they were, uh, which they would carry on to see if they could find anything. Uh, and you see the best ones, and you can see the highest level of significance they found was 1.49 times 10 to the power of minus 4. So really, this study, using the technology that they had available in 2011, was somewhat negative. And there's not a reflection that they, as we saw earlier from Bouchard's twin study approach, that those genes aren't there, but the tool wasn't right. Which is going to be another message for you, is that your tools determine what outcome you actually eventually get from your work. And typically, the better tools tend to cost more. Um, then I must remind you the great advance that really happened in 2001, which were two different, uh, in two different uh, groups, the sequencing of the, the human genome, where now we know in some ways the, um, the outcomes of that was oversold to a certain extent. Okay? And we may discuss that later on during the day. Um, so moving on to the next big development of the time was Kathy North's work also dwelling on or using the candidate gene approach. And her work still today is probably the most important in terms of having genes, identifying a gene that has some clinical utility. And again, here's a slide uh, from a talk that Kathy gave to us here in Glasgow. Um, and, and you can see her conclusion. The presence of ACTN3 provides an advantage for elite sprint athletes. The absence of, of a, uh, ACTN3 may provide an advantage for elite endurance athletes. And these effects, she said, were more pronounced in Olympians and female athletes. Remember, alpha-actinin is, uh, is one of the proteins involved in the, um, the structure of, uh, of skeletal muscle, in particular in the sliding filament theory, remind our uh, biology. And, and this is the study from which she was able to conclude the previous slide. Um, in Australia, in a, in, a Europe, uh, in, in a cohort that she looked at, you can see the numbers here, she found that 20% of this uh, Caucasian population did not produce um, ACTN3. They had the XX genotype. And you can see the, the ratio of the other two here. That when they looked at sprint athletes, this was in association with the Australian Institute of Sport, what's quite profound here is that none of the sprint Olympians, none of the female uh, sprinters, actually had the XX. So all of those great sprinters had ACTN3, and this was really quite profound at the time. If you look at this side here, okay, which has got to do uh, with endurance, it was the other way around, that the XX version, not having this, the ACTN3, was overrepresented, and more so in the female athletes, hence her conclusion. We then went on, together with Kathy North's group and others, to try and replicate that in, in, in some great sprinters. And just briefly here on the, on the left-hand side, you see we, we managed to do that. This is the um, XX version, so not having it. This is the Olympic qualifying time. You can see that not having the right genotype here meant that you didn't achieve Olympic qualification time. Here, if you had the RR or the RX, you had a better chance of doing it. And there was also a difference between the RX and the XX. Interestingly, we found the same uh, support for uh, Hugh Montgomery's uh, uh, hypothesis in terms of the ACE gene, we found the same thing, which supported the fact that these two genes, um, going right back to the 1990s, are uh, the only still two genes that have some clinical utility, but not to the extent that we can predict performance, as will become clear as I move forward. Jumping further, um, uh, and one of the uh, fascinations I've had throughout my career, and I still have this fascination, is why is it that in Olympic events, take the 100 meter sprinters, uh, typically all finalists are from a more recent African descent. Put in, an, in another way, are all black from typically West African ancestry. And in the marathon event, why are they all typically from East African region? And that is a question uh, that, was, uh, uh, that really required an answer back then. And uh, I set up the International Center for East African Running Science, I think in early 2000 here in Glasgow, to study this phenomenon. Because what we knew then, and this slide I've been updating throughout my career, and it always has the same response. This is the Doha World Championships of a few weeks ago. What is quite obvious to see that every single gold medal in the uh, 1500 meters to the marathon, in the men and the women's event, 
Oh, don't worry about the flags. These are all Ethiopian and Kenyan athletes. And if you look also on the right-hand side here, only, there are only four European athletes here, one male and three females. And the question is, why this phenomenon? And I don't have time to dwell and go into the details of this, but clearly the kind of conclusion one gets from, and the media likes talking about this, is that white men can't run from the movie White Men Can't Jump, obviously. And we did a lot of work at the time based in Glasgow. I don't have the time to go through this, but I just want to um, uh, focus on a few individuals. The late Richard Wilson, uh, who taught me probably everything I know about uh, molecular biology. Uh, he passed away some years ago now. And you'll see most of these names here, if you can see them, Colin Moran, um, uh, Robert Scott, all were based here um, at the University of Glasgow. So a lot of this was done um, uh, not too far away from here. And just to get straight to the conclusion here, is that genetic studies of, of elite distance runs from Kenya and Ethiopia and sprinters from Jamaica, USA, and Nigeria do not find these athletes possess a unique genetic makeup. Rather, they serve to highlight the high degree of genetic diversity among the ethnic groups. And it's unjustified, therefore, to regard ethnic difference in sporting success as genetically mediated. To justify doing so, one must identify the genes that are important, which until now has proven elusive. This is not completely over yet. We are continuing. We are able, as you'll see shortly, to go on to the kind of whole genome approaches. But my prediction is that that's going to be the conclusion at the end. And just to be very clear, because sometimes the, pop, the popular media tends to misunderstand this, we are not saying genetics is not important. We are saying that genetics does not predict this phenomenon and is not responsible for the phenomenon. But what is still very important is how we select our parents in terms of our individual genetics. Jumping further ahead, um, the big consortia studies, like the International HapMap Project, the ENCODE Project, the 1000 Genomes Project, these, these big uh, multi-center international uh, collaborations really taught us a lot about why these approaches that I've mentioned to you were failing. Um, uh, and, a, and a good illustration of that is when it comes to height. And this was published in 2004, trying to understand uh, the genetics of height. And in 2004, despite a lot of effort, there were only 47 loci in the genome that were explaining only about 5 to 10% of height. So you can see the problem. If we can't identify height, which is clearly much easier in terms of a phenotype to measure than sports performance, you can see the difficulty. Years later, now in uh, 2014, and we can carry on right up until now, there are now more variants, and now accounting for only 20% of height. So you can see the challenge ahead. We need to think out of the box. And as I said to you, the approach now is to use whole genome approaches, and, um, and here's your p-value that you require. These are the autosomes. You can see the areas where associa strong associations have been found. Um, and I did this assessment a few months ago, and as from early on this year, there were close to 4,000 publications interrogating the whole genome, and you can see the number of uh, polymorphisms associated with uh, traits of particular interest. A lot of work, a lot of money, very little clinical utility at this stage. And to show how that also works in sport and exercise medicine, here's a collaboration that we were part of to tr try and understand the genetics of a simple phenotype, which is hand grip strength. And you can see here the, the number of authors. More importantly, having a lot of authors and centers means that you, your population goes to 195,000. And you can see when I interrogate some of the other studies shortly, why you can't do these studies with 20 individuals, 30 individuals. We needed 195,000 to reach that level of statistical significance. Here are the top genes that we, we identified. I'm not going to go through them. I'm just trying to illustrate to you what one needs to do before saying, I found these genes or I failed to find these genes. Um, therefore, the question, because obviously a lot of what, we can, what we're talking about is about genetic testing in sport and exercise medicine, huge emphasis on talent identification, for example. Well, given all those GWAS studies I mentioned to you, how many do you think are in sport and exercise medicine and therefore being able to support the work of these genetic, uh, of these genetic uh, companies who are doing these kind of tests. And you'll be very surprised to know that there's only one. And you can see that basically these companies are trying to sell us something where there isn't actually the data out there from which they can base their test. And this is actually a study that we were involved with. You can see some of the typical faces. It's Kathy North, uh, myself, uh, much younger myself when I was in Glasgow, uh, Claude Bouchard and, and others. 
And we, what we try to do, and it's applying a consortium approach, where you actually combine your resources to increase the numbers. You can see the number of athletes here, the number of world-class athletes, the number of controls. Um, and the finding, which you can read there yourself, was very disappointing. We found nothing. But the reason we also found nothing was that this study was funded internally by what small resources we all had, and Claude Bouchard at the time had access to this Illumina chip with only, I'll say only, 195,000 genes of interest, uh, gene variants of interest. And they may sound a lot compared to the candidate gene approach, but it's only a fraction of the 10 million variants that we know exist. So you can see the problem also to do with the technology of choice. But maybe also, one could argue, maybe the study was underpowered, but keep in mind those numbers as I move forward. Jumping further, so it's become very clear, I hope, to you all, that the approach in sport and exercise medicine to understand genetics, identify these genes, was problematic. There, weren't, there wasn't the money in place, there wasn't these international consortia besides the heritage study. So we needed to think out of the box. And some, of, some I can see from some members in the audience, like um, uh, my friend Mike McNamee sitting at the back there, we thought of an approach to try and solve some of this problem. Together with, um, uh, with uh, Cliff Suras at this meeting in Brazil, we said, what can we do to deal with this? And the decision we made was to, to invite the same contenders and new people working in the field to one of the most beautiful parts of the world, being Greek as well, I must stress my home, okay, um, the island of Santorini. And it was wonderful because every single person we wanted to come to this meeting, and, and I see also Nick Webborn in the audience, he also attended that meeting. Um, we, we got together to discuss how we're going to deal with this, how we're going to take this field forward. And we also should, should acknowledge FIMS as well. And you can see some of the, uh, the main uh, pioneers in the field attended. It was a super great meeting. Um, and just for, for those of you, um, the BASM members, and, and also for the executive, this was a partnership between FIMS and uh, the British Journal of Sports Medicine and, um, at the time. And you can see the, the profound outcomes from this one event when all of us got together. We published a number of papers. Here we're talking about the Athlon Consortium, the need to work together. Um, but this paper published in BJSM from that uh, meeting by Claude Bouchard really is probably the most important paper that if you're going to read one paper from what I presented today, this is the one you should read. And it's a very much downloaded paper because what Claude Bouchard, do, Bouchard does um, in this paper, he tells us why the field has failed in terms of not fail per se, but why it's been so difficult to identify these genes with clinical utility. And at the FIMS World Congress uh, in Slovenia some years ago, he actually said something quite profound that I must mention to you. He said that maybe it'll be never, it may never be possible to have genes with clinical utility to make a prediction. And I found that was really profound for him to say that. I don't fully agree with that, but it just shows you, and, and I'm not going to go through all this because of time, but it tells us some of the reasons. For example, uh, about 40 million common polymorphic sites in the genome. So it's going to be very difficult. And so what we do know, to summarize this, is that it's much more complex than initially envisaged. I would also argue much more fun as well. And my goal this morning is also through some of the younger students in the room to take on this challenge to try and identify these genes. So as a result of the, this uh, initiative, a number of uh, cohorts were developed. And just to show you an outcome of what can happen if we work together, the Japanese government funded the first study to sequence the genome in thousands of elite athletes. And you can see we are close to the end of that project and hopefully soon we can share with you the data from this uh, incredible 1,000 athlome study. So I want to, um, I'm running a little bit behind, but I'll, I'll catch up, don't worry. So the end of the historical account, before we get into speaking to the, about the company's work, is what you can see here, a summary of the field. So starting off back in, the, uh, in 2000, Bouchard would publish with his group a gene map of performance. And you can see every few years, there's a one, two, three, uh, 4,000, uh, 2004 updates and so on. Uh, and typically, you'll get this kind of a response where you can see the different autosomes, and you can see a total of 221 autosomal and X-linked genes associated with a phenotype of interest in one study. Mostly, these were never validated. They were never replicated. 
and hence this problem of clinical utility that I've mentioned to you. They then went on to talk about uh, the advances in, in exercise fitness and performance genomics. Again, the conclusion was the same. Interesting uh, variants to understand mechanisms, but in terms of genetic prediction, not very useful. So, let me get on to the main topic, and I, I will speed up, don't worry. So talk about harmful then. With that history now, let's try and interrogate the, um, how harmful this can be if not used properly. Because what we really want to do is be able to say, well, okay, using a hypothetical chip, can we identify the genes that are linked with tendinopathy, with sudden cardiac death, concussion, with, with performance? And that was the, what we were trying to do and what the field has been trying to do for some time. And I like using the slide because this was um, at an airport uh, in Tallinn. Um, just before boarding my flight, I was able to give my saliva sample, uh, and they said by the time I arrive at my destination, which is Barcelona, I would know my genotype and what sport I would be good at. And you could, this was some years ago, now 2013, and I just need to pay 95 euros. They didn't know who I was when they were sampling me. But uh, you can see the problems we are taught we're getting to. Just before um, preparing for this in the last few days, I went and actually looked to see if that company still exists, because a lot of these companies disappear because they've got nothing really to sell. And this company is doing even better now. So clearly, there is a market. People are buying these things. But let me show you, the, and there are other companies as well. Um, one other company is a company called DNA Fit that you may have heard of. Um, but to one of these kind of companies, we actually said, well, let's test them in terms of clinical utility. I took the best athlete I've ever worked with in my life. Okay, and those of you who follow my performance research will know who it is. And I sent that DNA sample anonymized to one of these companies. And this is the response I got. In terms of VO2 max, medium. In terms of personal injury, and I won't mention the athlete's name because I'll be in trouble, but this athlete is so delicate. He always breaks down. However, if you keep him healthy, he's incredible. So clearly you can see the problem I'm alluding to, okay? And it gets worse with some of these companies. Some of these companies now realize they can actually publish some of their work to have credibility. And what they do is they typically publish in journals where the reviewers know nothing about genetics. And you can see here a population of about 28 or 39, and the conclusion is our results indicate that matching the individual's genotype with appropriate training modalities leads to more effective resistant training. I don't have time to go through that, but that is completely nonsense. Um, and then they combine with um, high-profile athletes, like this uh, uh, double Olympian that we know very well, and that is what people, the message that the public uh, get from, the, from their website and from their marketing material. Yes, we write to them. We wrote to the journal saying, you know, this is just nonsense. But how many people get to see this? Nobody. And you can see the issue, therefore. And also what happens, you may recall this situation prior to the last World Cup. Who was the most talked about athlete? Mo Salah. Um, and one of these companies uh, jumps onto the bandwagon here and say, they are going to help uh, identify new Mo Salahs and also help the, the Egyptian team. Well, clearly their technology didn't work because Egypt didn't win a game. Um, but besides that, but, you, but the problem with this now is that this then draws attention from the investors, often called angels, who've got a lot of money to burn, and they say, ah, oh, this is going to work. And what actually happened was, this company was bought for $10 million um, as a result of, wow, they're going to do something amazing. This is a great place to invest my money. Um, the company which bought them is called uh, Prenetics. Um, some interesting uh, marketing, as you can see here. I'm going through this very quickly. They can do nutrigenomics and lifestyle, pharmacogenomics, cancer selection, family planning. Uh, they can tell you what to eat based on your genotype, which is obviously not uh, what we can do today. Their global fingerprint around the world. Uh, the experts they have, I'm particularly interested in this guy here, okay? Uh, this is the one who's really gonna advise me. Um, uh, they have the typical great um, uh, change makers, the great names like Brian Habana and, and Kirsty Gallagher and so on to sell. And this is also interesting. The last few days I noticed they're actually selling their um, new exome uh, uh, test. I did this about four days ago and it says two days to go to launch. I did it again this morning, and it still says two days to launch, okay, which is interesting, but now 93% um, has been reserved already. 
Um, I wouldn't rush to go and reserve a place on this. But you can see the, count, the amount of money it, it costs to have your whole exome sequenced here, 299 pounds. Yes, you can do that lab work for that amount of money, but what, are, what can you use this information today? As, as I'm alluding to at the moment, not very much. Let's listen to what the CEO of the company thinks and why he got into it very briefly. I was 37 years old when my DNA test results showed I have a high risk of developing colorectal cancer. I was surprised. I then found out that approximately 40% of individuals with a gene mutation do not have a family history of cancer, which is my case. And at first, the word cancer evoked fear in me. But when I discovered that the majority of people who develop colon cancer often get diagnosed when it's too late, something in me switched. I felt blessed because having this knowledge early means I can take proactive measures to prevent cancer. Life often throws obstacles in our way, and some people run away from them and others towards them. My life has always been about turning a negative into a positive. While I can't change my DNA, what I can control is my diet, my exercise, and my mindset. I've just turned 40, and I've never felt healthier. Yes, cancer is scary, but ignorance is fatal. I now have the tools to live a healthy, proactive life. A life where I can see my daughter get older, watch her graduate high school, and witness the birth of her own child. A life where I get to do what I love, working with talented people and amazing colleagues. A life where I help to give everyone the power to be in control of their Okay, I'll stop there because of time, but you get my point there. This is very, very powerful. If I hadn't given you the introduction and gone straight into this, into this little video clip, how many of you, even the physicians in the audience, would have run out to do the test? A number of you would have, okay? And that's the problem. They're working with our emotions, with our fear of getting cancer, getting this, all these. And also, the point I'm trying to also want to make here is that I'm not saying these approaches in the future aren't going to be very powerful and very important. That's why it's the opportunity. But we, can we be selling now this kind of approach today? I think we shouldn't be, but we'll come back to that. Um, Laura tells me I have 14 minutes, so we're okay. Um, so headlines now, and as I, said, as I mentioned to you, a lot of this work now is being financed out of Asia, in particular out of China. And you can see this recent headline, Gattaca by 2022. Um, and I'm, I, sh I think most of you have seen the movie Gattaca. I'll, I'll conclude with, a, the, um, with a mentioning the movie again, uh, which very much talks about the ethics of trying to select individuals. And you can see the headline here, China to select the Winter Olympic athletes based on their genes. And if you look on this side, it's very small. They're saying they're sequencing a lot of these young aspiring athletes from which they're going to select the team based on this approach. As I've alluded to at the moment, can that be done today and actually select your team? And you can see the problems, I've already alluded to the problems that you will get. And I'm sure we'll discuss this also more in the next session on um, genetic editing. So is this real or is it fake news? There's a lot of fake news around and clearly I'm moving towards the situation that this is actually fake news. Um, the other outcome in terms of this testing and as outcome of the uh, Santorini event and a paper that uh, we're very proud of, uh, first author Nick Webborn, who uh, said he's in the audience, um, a paper that gets a lot of attention, is the consensus of firms and the group uh, that, that um, got together in Santorini and the conclusion from this was that current genetic testing has zero predictive power on talent and should not be used by athletes, coaches, or parents. But the market is booming. Uh, that was some years ago now. We since uh, have moved on um, with the World, uh, the World Congress in Ljubljana that I mentioned before. Um, similar, similar people involved. And the conclusion, you don't have to read that because it's identical. Again, you know, no progress in terms of clinical utility. So moving on, so, you, so you, I alluded to some of the harmful issues associated with this work. But some tell me that this can be fun. And I know Christmas is coming up, and what a lot of people do, they send you for, as a Christmas present um, to do a genetic test to identify whether you are related to Cleopatra. Now, who cares about that? But anyway, let's see if it's fun. Um, I don't know if there's any Eurovision fans in the audience, okay? I'm probably the only one. But I went to Eurovision Israel this year, and you may say, well, what are you doing in, in, um, in uh, Eurovision? Um, and there's a picture of me, it's really embarrassing, but anyway. Um, I went because this was sponsored by my heritage, okay? Which, as we all know, is determining your ancestry. And have a short, look at the short clip of what they were promoting at the time, because of time. So what does this all mean in terms of this kind of approach? And you can see the headlines also in the media, which at this time are correct. Um, 
to, uh, it made me question my ancestry. Does DNA home testing really understand race? Consume, uh, consumer DNA testing promises more than it can deliver. Don't buy online DNA ancestry testing, you are the real product, which is really what the message I'm trying to convey in terms of some of these things. Um, I'm, I love wine, it'll become very clear the next two days, okay? But these tests can also tell me, okay, which version of wine I should, what bottles I should get. Typically I know which ones I get, but I can't afford them. But genetic testing tells me something quite different. Now, this company is very interesting. Because this company was set up by the founder, or, the, or the, um, uh, Craig Fenter, the guy who sequenced the genome. And he set up his own company. I don't think he's involved anymore. He may have sold it on. But they are offering doing the same thing for $25,000. Now, you can see this is more likely to generate something more useful because they're going to try and do the kind of thing we need to do in everybody, and not the 299 pounds. And even so, I don't think there are millions of people flocking to go and do this, because even with that amount of investment, you don't get the clinical utility that we require. But that I found very interesting. And I think this is a nice way to get my message across from others, experts in the field. It's not that companies that are selling tests are somehow evil, they just promise too much. I just tell people up front, if you're going to get this test, the odds are that you're going to come back with nothing. They are giving us what the market wants, not what the genetic tells us, which I think is the message. And so here are some of the dangers rather than fun. Hacking, I mean, is the data safe? Who may profit from your DNA? Clearly not you. Laws covering genetic privacy are not broad enough. We need rules also in sport and excise medicine, and we'll conclude just now on that. Law enforcement knows these companies have your DNA, and they may want it, already asking and already using it. A positive example where it can produce a result, but what happens if someone sends my DNA under their name, I get accused of, a, of some uh, uh, criminal event. Companies go bankrupt. A lot of these companies are going to go bankrupt. What happens to your DNA after they go bankrupt? You can see the problems. Also, how can you control for what your cousin does? Here's a great athlete uh, that we all know, uh, Novak Djokovic. We know his, uh, his ancestral genome. Why? Because his cousin, um, uh, advertised his genotype, his, um, his uh, my, my, um, I think this is, this is the um, uh, uh, Y chromosome genetics, okay? And you can see the problem here. I'm sure Novak didn't want to have his, his uh, information on the web, but that's what happened as a result of this. So going to the last section in seven minutes that I have, I'm going to have to jump a few things, but we heard earlier this morning um, the message from Fabio Picozzi about firms' involvement in sport and exercise minutes, the, the idea to unite. And we have centers around the globe, now 29. And as chair of the Science Commission, I can influence a little bit as to the areas that I would like us to focus in the next years. Um, I won't bore you with the details of the collaborating centers. But these are the four areas where if I had more time, and I would actually go through and, exp and show you why all of these are areas that we can produce clinical utility to understand better the issue of cardiac sudden death, mental health, and as um, Dora mentioned, the issue of anti-doping. And because of time, I'm going to jump to the last one, which is anti-doping, so just bear with me to get to those slides, because we can't do this, I'm afraid, now. Um, uh, maybe it's worth listening to one of the, the uh, this outcome from a BJSM um, uh, article that received a lot of attention about um, testing in terms of, and screening for uh, cardiac sudden death, where there was a debate about the screening doesn't work or that screening should be used, um, and especially adding um, ECG. And just listen to this short clip of the conclusion that I think is really uh, helpful. Listen to this. What can be expected and hoped for in the future is that we will uh, find genetic tests that are finding out with a certainty if a given a genetic hereditary disease is present. So in other words, they are actually both agreeing that maybe the current tests are problematic because of the tools we are using, and that's why I think this is a great move in the right direction. Mental health, again, we know it's a big problem. This was a big issue in the last few weeks, uh, remembering uh, um, the, the great uh, goalkeeper who had no signs of suffering from mental illness and took his life. And, and there's been other great high-profile athletes. We are working with the Olymp World Olympian Association. There are 10,000 uh, Olympians alive, 10, um, 100,000 Olympians alive, 10,000 members. And we are embarking on the, uh, in collaboration with the World Olympian Association, the, the first uh, health study 
where already some of the outcomes are showing that uh, athletes really suffer from, from uh, issues of mental illness, two times more, more frequent than the general population. And just to jump ahead, uh, genetics can help us. 10 years of genome work has shown a large number of genes that, are, uh, that, that have some predictive capacity may be important, and we will pursue that. But I want to get to the last section, which is uh, the anti-doping one. And, and, and uh, Dora mentioned the issue of um, uh, what the president of the IOC said, but maybe a lot of you weren't aware of this. Listen to the message. Second, the IOC will ask the ITA to already collect the appropriate samples to be analyzed by the new genetic sequencing method as early as the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020. Okay, so I have two minutes, so let me just tell you a little bit about that. So as already mentioned, genetic sequencing is the way we need to go forward to actually get all the information we want. And that is now what, with the support of the IOC, we will be able to do. And already I'm in discussion with some of you in the audience about exploiting some of your samples that you have access to as well. For example, uh, with Mike Turner, we're discussing the issue of concussion uh, to working together. So and you can see the headline here, sequencing will be on the par with that of the microscope. Um, I don't have time to show you the data from this, but just jumping maybe just one data set. This is, uh, we are finding over 2,000 transcripts that are being switched on two weeks after the last injection of EPO. There's the last injection of EPO, that's the sample there. Over 2,500 using genetic sequencing technology. Compare a gene chip, only 18. So you can see how powerful this, this approach is. It gives us a lot of information from network analysis. You can understand which pathway is involved. As a biological passport expert, you can start telling if an athlete is doped or if an athlete has gone to altitude or to individualize training, individualized rehabilitation, individualized nutrition. This is incredibly powerful, as you can see. Here's the sequencer that's being installed as we speak in, at the University of Brighton, my new home. Uh, this is the BGI, the company where they have 175 sequences doing this kind of a job. Um, I've already shown you that. Um, and the way this is really going to work is when we combine all these omics in what's called multi-omics approach. But combining this also with very powerful computing, computing power is dramatically changing. Already um, uh, iPhones have more computing power than a typical computer had when I was starting off in my career. Quantum computers are coming, which can do, as you can see from this headline here, um, they can do a task, that normally, uh, a specific task in 200 seconds that will take the world's fastest supercomputer 10,000 years to complete. So imagine incorporating, and my time is up, so almost there. So using this kind of tool will allow us to be, for the first time, ahead of the testers. Sorry, the testers, the, the, the cheaters, which I think is really powerful and really exciting. So this is what we really want to do. To, to go from the normal population to individual response. I've, hopefully I've showed you what we need to do, the dangers well of the testing approaches, how we're going to advance in the areas of personalized medicine, stratified medicine, personalized prescription. There are dangers. We'll hear some of those from Mike McNamee and Perry Simon uh, uh, later on, just, just after this coffee break. And I knew I'd run out of time. I knew that I'd go too fast. I knew I could probably confuse some of you. Hopefully, we're in the final stages of this uh, partnership with BASM, EFSMA, and FIMS, this publication, which we hope will be accepted. We, we are at the final stage of the, of the review process, where we summarize a lot of what I've said uh, in this publication, which I hope, uh, in one way or the other, uh, will be out soon. Um, I've been asked as well to reiterate, we hope to see you in Brighton. And with that, thank you very much. And sorry to sped up in, at the end.